The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the third chapter of the book of James. James chapter 3. We'll begin in verse 13, read through chapter 4, verse 3, and then find our way down to verse 7 and 8 there. But James chapter 3, beginning with verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and you do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God, as we come to hear from your word, Help us, Lord, through your Holy Spirit to hear your words and not the ones that I happen to put in the way. Let your words be one, words that stir us and that call us ever on in this journey of faith. Words that transform us more and more into the likeness of your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, I walked through the door of our little narrow cinder block classroom out into the shop where we had several stations set up in the different bays of the garage. It was the morning of our chapter of the Vocational and Industrial Club of America. Was anybody in that club besides me? We wore really sharp red blazers. We were called VICA, what we called. They changed it to Skills USA because I think it sounds better. VICA sounds like a a house at at Hogwarts or something. Um, But it was our school VICA competition for auto mechanics and welding, and I was competing in the auto mechanics competition, which, frankly, the word competing is a generous one to say. In the first bay of the shop was an old Ford Falcon that someone had brought over with them on the Mayflower and had uh, donated to the church. There in that bay, Mr. Waddell, our teacher, along with a few volunteers, had crossed the plug wires, disconnected some electrical components, and the job there was to to go to that bay and get the old car running in a few moments and figure out the problem. In the second bay was a Dodge Neon that the local Chrysler dealership had donated with a check engine light on. You were supposed to diagnose the source of the light and and then sort of uh, recommend some proper repairs. There was also a, a metal table set up with a car battery, a few light bulbs, some wires, toggle switches. The point there was to follow a schematic and wire up a couple of circuits correctly. But the station that I was assigned to first, where I had to start the competition, was easily the most difficult one. It was there on another one of those tables, clamped in a vise, was a drum brake. A drum brake. We had to take off the brake shoes, reinstall them, put the drum back on, and the one who could do it the fastest would win that station and most likely the whole competition. Now, I'm going to skip to the end because I know you're all wondering. Yes, I won. I won the whole thing. 
Not bragging, just saying, I won. <clears throat> but now, I won mostly because I, I knew how to do each of those tasks at each station, partly because, probably didn't hurt, Mr. Waddell and my dad are best friends and have been best friends uh, for most of their lives, and I also happen to know just about all of the volunteers because they were from the local Chevy dealer where I worked every afternoon. I had the old Ford Falcon running in a few minutes, wired up the circuits on the table, no problem, called the code on the check engine light in just a few seconds, and the drum brakes. Well, drum brakes are old hat. By the time I saw them during that competition, I had changed at least half a dozen sets, front and rear, of drum brakes on the old jalopies and junk heaps we kept around the house. Most of the other kids in the shop didn't even know what they were looking at. They thought something had fallen off a spaceship. They didn't know. But I almost lost the whole competition, too, because of those drum brakes. You see, on the table where this was set up were all the tools one would need, all kinds of tools, in fact, to sh uh, change a set of brake shoes, a pair of brake pliers, removal tools for hold-down springs, brake spoons, and, of course, safety goggles, which everybody tells you to wear, but nobody wears. They're on the table. I never used any of those things before. Every other time I changed a pair of brake shoes, I used the way my dad taught me, a big old screwdriver, a pair of vice grips, and a pair of slip joint pliers, and I never touched the safety goggles. When I finished, Bill, Mr. Waddell came over and told me, he said, now, Mr. Thomas, he liked to call me that for whatever reason, Mr. Thomas, you did a fine job, did it quickly, you did it right, except that the folks in Montgomery are going to disqualify you because you didn't use the right tools. And in fact, you wouldn't have had a chance because you didn't put on the safety goggles. I remember telling him, I said, well, Mr. Waddell, I guess it really doesn't matter how you get there, right? So long as you get there. It doesn't matter how you get it done, right? So long as you get it done. And I suppose, I suppose that's true for a lot of things in life, isn't it? It doesn't matter how you get there, doesn't matter what means you take, what road you travel, what motivates you, so long as you wind up in the right place, right? But is that what, is that what the life of faith is about? I mean, is that true for people of faith, that it doesn't matter how you get there so long as you wind up there? Is that true when it comes to living a life modeled after the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. Is it true, so far as it involves what James calls in our text this morning, a good life? If I'm honest with you, I'm not too sure. To be honest, I think James would say no. No, it does matter. It most certainly matters how you get there, especially as it comes, as it concerns what motivates you in this life of faith. Now, to be fair, th there's not much we know about James' intended audience in this letter. Unlike Paul, James doesn't address his letter to a congregation in a certain city. You know, Paul says to the church at Thessalonica, to the church at Corinth. James doesn't say that. He just simply says to the twelve tribes in the dispersion. Maybe an allusion to Jewish Christians living outside of Judea. Maybe a way of addressing Jewish Christians in general. Or maybe just some ancient sort of pseudo-theological way of talking about all Christians. I don't know. Somebody else probably does, but I don't. And what's more, James doesn't really give us much in the way of understanding exactly what's going on in this congregation to whom he writes. I mean, he gives us little breadcrumbs, hints here and there. We've read one of them. Just a couple of weeks ago, if a person with gold rings and fine clothes comes into your assembly, there's a, maybe a little conflict there. Another place, he says, not many of you should become teachers. Maybe there were folks in Sunday school shouldn't have been there. I don't know. Another place, he says, come now, you rich people. Seems like they have a problem with rich folks there. And another place, he says, are any among you suffering? He asks in a rhetorical sense to where the, the expected answer is yes. So maybe... Maybe there's some suffering going on. I don't know. But unlike Paul and the other writers of, say, the Johannine epistles, James doesn't get down to naming names. So we're not too sure. 
Not too sure what prompted James to write. What it is that, that, that spurred James to write this letter, this pastor of this church somewhere in the dispersion. But you ask any pastor who's been around the barn long enough, and they'll tell you why James wrote. They'll tell you why James sat down to pen a letter to a church that he had once shepherded. Especially when you read these words in front of us. Why James may have caught wind of a situation like the one involving Mary. I showed up to the church one Friday to clean up before services on Sunday. And there on the table in our little fellowship hall was a cardboard box had the picture of a three-in-one printer and the word brother on it. Next to it, another box with a filing cabinet in it. Mary had decided on her own that the church needed a file cabinet and a really nice color printer. It also functioned as a fax, copier, and scanner. Mary said she donated this copier and the file cabinet to the church. But then she said, uh, well, you know, I'll, I'll be using it from time to time myself since I donated the printer after all to print personal pictures. But by the end of our conversation, which was not very long, Mary had decided, well, you know what, it just makes more sense if I take it back home with me, set it up in my little study at my house. It's just across the road. She said, I'll probably use it more than other folks at the church anyhow. She didn't even take time to take it out of the box before loading it in the back of her Suburban. And as she shut the door and cranked the engine, she said, oh, and by the way, make sure the treasurer gives me a tax receipt on Sunday for my donation awful nice of her, wasn't it, to donate the printer to the church. Or maybe James had someone like Lacey in his congregation. Lacey was a nice woman. She had a trio of sons who I think were born a hundred years too late. They liked to catch skunks and raccoons, play with snakes, that sort of thing. Not in the old Baptist sort of way, you know, just like to play with them. Well, Lacey said one day she needed to talk to me after church on Sunday, so the service was over. We were standing on the little back porch of the church, and I said, Lacey, what is it? She said, well, I've got this idea about how to save the church some money. Oh, that's always nice. I'm always willing to hear those kind of suggestions. I said, what's your idea? She said, well, you know, every spring and summer we are always paying someone to come and cut the grass. I said, yeah, that, that's true. She said, well, what if the church just bought a real good lot more? And then one of my boys would come and cut the grass every so often. I don't think that might work. I said, she said, well, good. Well, what if we just keep it at our house and we use it, and every so often, you know, when we need to cut the grass, the boys will come down here and cut the grass at the church. Sure was nice of her to want to save the church all that money, wasn't it? I think James is dealing with the same things a lot of us realize, that, that, that some folks can be downright inspired to do the Lord's work, to help their church and their community if there's something in it for them. Whether it's a nice tax break, the use of the church van. Pre preacher, we just need to borrow the van. Uh, the, the kids, we went out to ball practice, going to take them out to ice cream. Be not, can we use the church van? Get the name in the paper. Well, yeah, yeah, I attend that church on Christmas and Easter and that most saintly of High Holy Days, Mother's Day. So make sure you put my name down. And when you write my name up in the paper, that I'm a good churchgoer. There's a lot of folks who will step right up to make sure that their name is counted on that list. And I suppose there may be some good in that. I think there probably was even in James' day. I mean, in that little church, we did use that copy or maybe to print one or two bulletins. And I'm sure if we had bought that more, those boys would have cut the grass at least once or twice. And there was that one church that I preached at in college. When you walked in, there was the piano and a brass plaque the size of the pulpit telling you who gave it and how much money it cost when they gave it. But James says, if the motive for the gift if the reason one gives his or her time, money, energy, whatever, is remotely motivated by selfish gain, James seems to suggest that such an offering comes from anywhere but God. In fact, he says it's earthly, unspiritual, devilish. But James isn't dealing with folks looking for a tax receipt or trying to bum equipment off the church or someone trying to count their name on the membership roll so they can get married at the church for free or use the gymnasium. James seems to be speaking to a more serious issue. 
a more common, ancient, universal issue among those bodies that call themselves churches. James says, for where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. And then he asks, those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? What's really going on in this congregation that James is talking to? Disorder? Conflicts? Disputes? And what's, the, what's behind it all? What's driving it all? Envy and selfish ambition. You see, it wasn't that the folks in this congregation didn't necessarily get along. And it wasn't that things weren't necessarily getting done. James doesn't suggest that the people are lazy, that they're ungiving, or that they're inactive. No, no, no. They come to church. They write the check. They show up. They volunteer. They bring the covered dishes. But James says it's their motives. Their means to their shared end that's at fault. Because what's really at the heart of their conflicts isn't something like theology. It isn't a difference in biblical understanding or ethical ideology. They hadn't been around long enough to have any of those things. No, the source of these conflicts James is writing about is the selfish ambition, the personal agendas, and envy in the hearts of members of the congregation. In other words, there were folks who were claiming to do the, works, the Lord's work in that little congregation for James, but really what they had in mind was not the Lord's work, but their own work. And can I tell you something? And I really mean this. I don't think that's always an intentional thing. What I mean is, I don't think it's always something that comes from a place of an in intentional wickedness. I'd go so far as to say that at least in our context these days, that there are a lot of folks who just can't help it. They can't. They can't help it because they can't see past their own ideologies, past their own worldviews, their own self-interest, past the ability to understand that maybe their desires, their perspectives, their comfort isn't the right motivation for the work of God's kingdom. And hear me when I say this, that's, I, I think that's the truth for people all up and down every spectrum of every issue, ideology, or denomination. Whether it's the fundamentalist preacher who's worked himself into a lather, slamming his fist on the pulpit, telling folks who he ought to vote for, or the, or the pastor who stands in her pulpit in the ivory tower and tells every other pastor, if you don't preach about this on Sunday, you're not right. It doesn't matter. Up and down the spectrum. So often, folks pray, speak, and act from a place they believe to be grounded in some sort of theological conviction, yet if they really plumbed the depths of their own souls, really sought to ground their prayers, words, and actions in an intentional and meaningful reflection upon the very reality of God, the words and actions themselves might not change, but their very understanding and motivations behind them would. They'd cease coming to church just so they can get to heaven and maybe show up to worship God. But I think it's easy. Really, I think it's easy to fool ourselves into believing that what makes us comfortable, what feels familiar to us, is always what's right. It's easy to give into that idea because I think it's right, because I've always believed this or that, because I deep down know that I'm right. Whatever affirms my preconceived notions must be, in fact, the right path. And when that happens, when we give in to that way of thinking, our actions tend to find their root in our comfort, in our idea of rightness. And we may, in fact, lose sight of what is actually in the best interest of our neighbors, our families, and for James, even our churches. This congregation with James seems to be consumed by conflict. If you read what James says, that's what it looks like. But it's the kind of conflict that boils below the surface. The church to which James is writing isn't having long, drawn-out business meetings with, with folks shouting each, at each other over the color of the carpet. People aren't threatening each other with physical harm or threatening to take their families and their ties to the megachurch across town. That's not happening. No, most likely the sort of conflict in James' congregation 
It's the type that happens, you know, in those private meetings in the parking lot. Those telephone calls in the morning. The conversations that take place in the produce aisle. The folks in his congregation aren't conflicted when it comes to theology, scripture, ideas like circumcision or the nature of God in Christ. Not really. Some of those things, again, they haven't even figured out yet. Their conflicts, James says, are about personal comfort. About keeping things the way they want them. About making sure their kind of folks are in and the wrong kind of folks are out. Isn't that what we read in the early chapters of James? You want to keep the poor out and welcome the rich in. That's the source of their conflict. And so James asks, those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? Do they not really come from your own self? The conflicts in James' congregation aren't really about theology. Church disputes rarely ever are. The lack of peace at the heart of his congregation stems from selfish ambitions, envy, a desire for personal comfort at the heart of some of its members who wish to keep things in line with their way of thinking, the right way they believe to do Christ's work. But here's the thing. It doesn't matter where you are on that, what you think is right. James says you can desire to do the right thing, but if you do it for the wrong reasons, you'll fail every single time. You ask and do not receive, James says, because you ask wrongly. You can ask for the right things, want to do the right things, but if you ask for them from a place of personal desire, of ambition, envy, or self-centeredness, it will not come to fruition. Now can't we sum up just about every conflict in human history imagined in that way? A result of one or more people believing they see things the right way, but they're doing it for the wrong reasons. It does matter how we get there, doesn't it? James says where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first, he says, pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And then James says, a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace, for those who make peace. That last sentence, it, made it, it almost snatches the rug out from under you. Whenever you are sort of amen in James right along, then he says that a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Why is that so hard for us to get? Why are we, and I say we, I mean us as the human race, why are we convinced that the way to make peace is to start a fight? How in the world can we claim to, to, to want to have unity but cause division? How in the world can brothers and sisters stand on opposite sides of a line they've drawn together, hurling insults and bombs at one another while claiming to follow the Prince of Peace? James says you can't. You can't do it that way. The way towards peace, the way towards reconciliation, the way of the Lord, James says, is found in letting go of that desire to always be right. The need to always be the winner. To pick sides and to choose favorites. The way of the Lord, James says, is paved with mercy and selflessness. A harvest of righteousness is not sown in the battle to prove one is more right than another. It is not sown in the soil of complacency or self-righteousness. James says a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. And that is just not as easy as it sounds. For it is sown in the loving, sacrificing humility of one who is willing to forego being right in order to first show love. It's shown in the soil of cooperation and conversation. The dirty work of listening to uh, someone that we may disagree with. 
The dirty work of actually having to love somebody we may think is unlovable. It's sown in the peace that comes from seeking first to listen and understand, rather seeking first to contempt, correct, or convert. A harvest of righteousness is sown in the peace, James says, that comes from being willing to yield, to give of oneself, the willingness to even be taken advantage of, or to be told you were wrong. Seems like I read somewhere about a man who did the same thing. Above all else, James says, it's a harvest sown only by the self-same work of love we see in Christ Jesus. The willingness to even lay down our very lives for someone else. Even those who might kill us. Those who might mock us. Those who might reject us. Those who might not extend to us the self-same courtesy of listening and seeking to understand first. James says, a harvest of righteousness is sown in the soil of peace, wrought by the work of selfless love. If we can figure that out, I think we get the rest of it figured out too. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, Lord, when even our best intentions may be grounded in selfish desire and ambition. Help us, God, to seek first your kingdom and the peace of love that you promised. To understand that it is hard work, but it is holy work to which you call us. And Lord, that it does matter. It does matter how we get there. So God, encourage us by the presence of your Holy Spirit. Inspire us, Lord, to do the work you call us to do. And stir even now in our presence, speaking to our hearts, showing us, Lord, the ways that perhaps we put ourselves first. And help us, Lord, to seek your forgiveness and redemption. We pray these things in Christ's holy name. Amen.